I'm Sahil. I am an MBA student at Frankfurt School. And previously, I have done my chartered accountancy from India, and I'm also a BCom graduate. I have uh, over eight years of work experience in uh, consulting and finance profiles, and currently, I'm uh, working in the strategy wing of a fintech firm in Frankfurt. Well, uh, I started mentoring students uh, to help them crack their GMAT exams since uh, two years now. And I myself got uh, 750 uh, on the GMAT, which is 98 percentile globally. And the one thing I figured out was that GMAT was not about genius. It was just about a good strategy. And that's precisely why I started mentoring students to help them uh, get good scores and obviously convert their team schools. I think uh, I have taken around, I think more than 400 GMAT sessions by now. Uh, sometimes group sessions, sometimes individual sessions, but yeah, on and off, I've taken more than 400 sessions. Uh, out of those uh, over, I think uh, 150 of them reported uh, that they got a score of 700 or more. So that uh, is something that has been uh, encouraging me to keep on doing these sessions. For applicants who want to pursue business or say students who want to pursue business, it can be anything. It can be MBA, it can be some business analytics uh, course, it can be master's in management. Uh, so for applicants who want to pursue business, they apply to business schools all over the world in thousands every year. Now business schools, in order to screen their cap applicants, uh, hold aptitude level as a criteria. And to test that aptitude level, some of the business schools have their own uh, in-house tests, but most of the business schools rely on the GMAT as as a reliable indicator of the aptitude level of their candidates. And this naturally means that the higher you score on the GMAT, the higher your chances uh, are uh, to convert uh, your, your uh, target school. You cannot fail the test. There is a score range of 205 to 805 and the 90th percentile is 645. So anything above the 90th percentile is considered a decent or a good score. And it means that when you when you get 645 plus, you uh, your profile becomes competitive for most business schools. So the GMAT is divided into three sections, verbal, quant, and data insights. Um, Largely, all of these uh, sections test your logical thinking and critical reasoning skills. In verbal, they give you uh, paragraphs of texts and they ask you to answer precise questions that have to do with interpreting those uh, texts well. So, for example, they'll give you a text and they'll ask you to pick uh, one of the choices that makes that argument or the author's argument stronger, for example. So that largely tests how well you interpret various situations. Quant, uh, it purely tests your application skills, your uh, logical uh, application skills, how quickly you are able to um, assess the problem, assess the relevant or uh, point out the relevant inputs, process them into a formula and come out with the correct uh, answer. Data insights in my opinion, is kind of a mix between verbal and quant. It, it gives you quantitative situations to analyze. So it will give you a chart or it will give you a lot of data. And the essence is to crunch the numbers, crunch uh, into, into the context that is presented in the question and come out with the correct response. The GMAT test is 2 hours and 15 minutes long. It is divided into three sections of 45 minutes each uh, for verbal, quant, and uh, data insights with an optional 10 minute break between uh, e uh, e any of the sections. So yes, it is time bound. Uh, the clock does run against you and you have to answer all the questions. If you miss out any question, there will be a penalty. So this is a good question. And before laying out something standard, I want to say that GMAT preparation is highly, highly, highly contextual and it is highly tailored to your situation. There is no standard way or an ideal way one should prepare for the GMAT. Uh, to give you a little bit context, normally people who uh, pursue uh, a master's in any, any sort of master's in business, they have some work experience or they're already working. 
most of my mentees are already working somewhere so it's not like you're a full time student and you have all the time in the world to dedicate like entire days to the gmat most of the times you have say a couple of hours in the morning or a couple of hours in the evening and maybe your weekends to prepare for it so given that context an ideal preparation time is around 3 months at say 2 to 3 hours in a day um if i quantify it it's it translates to roughly around 200 hours uh with a plus minus 40 hours and i think that is ideal uh to prepare for the gmat end to end but again it also depends a lot if you're an outlier who is very quick or if you're an outlier who's very slow then obviously you need uh, less or more time but uh, i would say this is uh, the ideal range for preparation i would say there is no standard answer yet here because it is highly tailored having said that um, if you are a self learner you like studying at your own pace in your own way then i would recommend self learning tools such as say the egmat or manhattan prep or uh, ttp where they have a very well structured um, syllabus uh, so as to speak but if you are somebody who likes learning or who finds the classroom uh, way of learning more effective then there are again a lot of uh, such online and offline uh, coaching institutes uh that you can take the help of for example the popular ones in india are time career launcher top 1% or if you are someone who needs a lot of hand holding and that's absolutely fine then i would highly recommend you go for a private tutor who can hand hold you end to end but what trumps all of this is that no matter which uh sort of learning method you like and which um which particular resource or which particular tutor you opt for have a strategy that trumps all have a precise strategy based on not just your daily routine but also uh, the nitty gritties of how you learn i would say uh, two major mistakes number one they don't have a macro level planning so for example if someone's earmarked 3 months for gmat preparation they start without a plan i would say structure those 3 months into broad milestones say by the end of the first month i'll be done with verbal by the end of the second month i'll be done with uh, quant and uh, data insights and third month half of the third month i'll be uh, doing only uh, practice questions and the remaining half i'll be doing only mocks so this is a broad structure with with uh, not very hard but yeah soft deadlines that is something that people don't do only to find that they have barely completed 40% of the syllabus and 80% of the time is gone uh the second mistake that people do is not revise their mistakes and this is one of the game changers that uh, form part of my overall strategy it simply means that when you are practicing right you tend to make a lot of mistakes normally what we do we look at the mistake we analyze it we understand what went wrong and then we move on but the thing is high chances you will forget what went wrong and the next time a similar question comes your brain will be wired to repeat that mistake so two days later same mistake two weeks later same mistake and two months later same mistake and the only way to overcome this inherent wiring that makes you think in the same direction again and again is to keep is to note down that mistake and keep revising it again and again again and again and again in in staggered uh, intervals that way you basically unwire and rewire your brain to think differently when not just that question but any similar question comes and that is where the bulk of your preparation roi is i would say 70% of your learning is in revising your mistakes i would say the gmat tests two things number one is yes it tests your aptitude your critical reasoning skills see in the verbal section of the gmat although although uh, it seems like it's verbal and it's long paragraphs and it's stories that you have to interpret it's actually testing your critical thinking skills which is a very quantitative abil- ability right it is testing how well you analyze those texts to come out with with uh, with a proper response right and it's not it's not subjective it's very 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 objective like if you do if you practice verbal enough you understand that it's it's absolutely like math there are 
there are some hidden codifications or formulas or ways to assess those texts. If you crack the code, you solve the most difficult of critical reasoning or uh, uh, reading comprehension questions in like 30 seconds. So even there, it, it is testing your critical reasoning skills. And, even, and now, obviously, when you come to data insights or quant, it's obviously numbers uh, and, and data all along. So yeah, uh, your logical uh, thinking uh, skills are also tested there. So yes, this would be my answer. But then the surprise here is that the format of the test. So this is the content of the test. The content tests your critical reasoning and logical uh, application. But the format of the test tests something else entirely, and that is your EQ, your emotional quotient, how well you're able to hold your nerve. And to give you a little bit insight, the GMAT is an adaptive test. So it means when you, when you answer the first question correctly, they increase the difficulty of the second question. You answer that correctly, they increase it further and further and further. Then maybe you answer this incorrectly, they decrease the difficulty level. And it comes down, it comes down. So based on your response, they keep increasing or decreasing the difficulty level of the questions. This means that God forbid, if you have answered a couple of questions incorrectly, the third question will be very easy and you'll know it. This means you will get an instant feedback. So now you know that easy questions are coming along the way and you know that you have probably solved the previous questions incorrectly. That feedback subtly, subtly makes you underconfident, you know, and it is precisely there that the exam tests, how well you hold your nerve, how well you tell yourself that, okay, fine. I've made a mistake. Fine. I have this question in front of me. I will answer it. Uh, I will try to answer it correctly. You know, that cold calculative mindset, that unemotional mindset that simply moves on. And by the way, even if the questions are more and more difficult, it does not mean that it will give you more confidence. What happens with very difficult questions is that some questions are a trap. I believe some questions are questions where the examiner probably knows that they will not be able to <laughs> solve it in, in a reasonable amount of time. So it also tests whether you are able to have the nerve to actually guess work and move on. It's better to solve three difficult questions than get caught up in one extremely difficult question. There's more ROI in that. So this is how it tests your emotional quotient, how, how, you know, the kind of nerves of steel you have, how well you race against the time. Uh, how well you are able to take those uh, split second decisions, whether to guesswork and move on, whether to, to get caught up in that question, uh, to, to maintain your pace despite the constant feedback. I would just add some attributes to anybody. Uh, anybody who has a well-structured, well-personalized strategy and is able to follow through that strategy with discipline and consistency. So structure, personalization, when it comes to strategy and when it comes to execution, discipline and consistency. You have these four elements, you'll be able to get 700 plus. GMAT does not, um, it, it's, it's not an exam where you need to be an absolute genius to crack. You just need a good plan. Simple as that. And I can vouch for this because I've had mentees who came in who were struggling for months, if not years, with 400, 500 plus scores. And they were able, they, we, we worked on a plan uh, together. And within three or four months, they were able to crack 700. It's all about consistency. And I believe consistency is the most difficult to achieve. And by consistency, again, this also uh, kind of uh, goes back to the question, what is one mistake that people make? I would also add this, people are not consistent or people have unrealistic expectations of consistency. When I say two hours, you have to sit every day. I don't mean that you have to really, really sit two hours. It, I know it can be someday, it can be one and a half hours. Someday it can be two and a half hours. Someday it will be just 30 minutes. Things change, situations change, especially when uh, people are working, working professionals, right? Consistency means even if you come and sit for half an hour, come and sit for half an hour, but show up every day. Initially, it will be a struggle. Your 
consistency curve will waver a lot but believe me after 20 or 25 days you will manage the time focus and the commitment to set for 2 hours every day so allow yourself that breathing space in the beginning to set up that consistency Thank you.